Signore e signori, cari amici, welcome, benvenuti. I am very excited to take you on this tour of Piazza del Duomo. Um, as I was getting ready for this walking tour, I also got very nervous because the monuments that sit in this square are some of the most beautiful, illustrious, uh, well-known, celebrated uh, monuments in the world. And there is so much to say. So I decided to take a deep breath, relax, and just enjoy the tour with you. Uh, I don't have any pretense of being exhaustive in giving you a general uh, exposition of, uh, of the city or of the Piazza del Duomo. But just simply um, come with me in this walking tour. I will tell you some stories um, that I hope you'll enjoy. And, um, and let's start. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is that this amazing concentration of works of art that we have here. Um, so just from this corner, you see the three monuments we're going to see. First the baptistry, then the cathedral, and then the campanile. Okay, let's start with the baptistry that is chronologically the first monument to be built. It's a, a monument that uh, dates back with certainty probably to the 11th century. There are many hypotheses, including one that was accepted for centuries, that this was originally a temple to the Roman god Mars, the god of war. We know that Florence, Florencia, was under the protection of the Roman god of war, uh, but it seems that it's an hypothesis that is void of uh, uh, historical foundation. So recently, the consensus seems to be that it's a, indeed an early Christian basilica in the Romanesque style that later was converted into a baptistry. Even if the octagonal form, octagonal shape, here we are watching one of the eight uh, sides of the baptistry, um, um, makes people think that it was conceived originally as a baptistry. So to make a long story short, nobody knows exactly when it was started and what was the original use. Uh, as a matter of fact, it turned into a baptistry, that is a place where baptism of the adults was administered um, normally twice a year, uh, on Easter Vigil and on another occasion. It's dedicated to St. John the Baptist, that is the patron saint of Florence, and you can see that after the restoration that took place a few years ago, the pattern, the bicolor pattern, that is also recurrent in other Romanesque uh, buildings in Florence, namely the Basilica and Abbey of San Miniato al Monte, is stunning. The contrast is between the white and the green, but the green is so dark, so it's the white from Carrara and the green is from Prato, but the green is so dark that it seem, seems almost like black, and therefore the contrast is very accentuated. And you see the beautiful uh, classical uh, shapes that you can recognize in the uh, baptistry. We are now getting close to uh, one of the doors. There are three doors. Um, this is the called uh, Porta del Pisano and it was originally the first one and these are stories from the life of Saint John the Baptist that you recognize and then on the lower uh, part you have the virtues. You have justice there and hope uh, that you should be able to see right now. And of course, these are uh, the doors, all three sets of doors uh, are copies. These are, the originals are in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, that is a museum that has just been restored and refurbished. And I strongly suggest you to uh, visit it the next time you come to Florence, because it's really worth seeing. Basically, almost all of the important statues that we will see in the outside are copies and the originals are indeed in the in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. So the baptistry sits between this palace here, that is the Archbishop's Palace, it's the residence of the Archbishop of Florence. As you see on top of that archway door, there are the two coats of arms of the Archbishop of Florence and of the reigning Pope, Pope Francis, and the cathedral. So this is the baptistry, this is the um, 
west side of the baptistry. We are walking around it, basically. And you can tell that the restoration was really perfect in bringing out this, the beautiful uh, colors in sharp contrast. We're now reaching the second sets of doors. These would be the northern door. Uh, this was the result. This was the second one to be built. And again, these are copies. The originals are in the uh, Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. And uh, we have records. This was the result. Ciao, Robin. This was the result of a competition. The Arte di Calimala, that was the uh, guild of all the merchants, very powerful. It was the first guild in Florence. Florence was a city indeed of merchants and bankers, but merchants of all sorts were uh, the most important ones. And they started a competition. They wanted to ornate the cathedral, the, the baptistry with another door. So they called for a competition where they invited all the most prominent artists of the time to participate. And the, the one thing they had to uh, abide by was to accept to create um, prototypes for the door that would fit into this very peculiar shape. It's called quadrilobata. There are four round uh, um, corners and, and four square corners. So that you see the annunciation scene. Once again, this is, uh, these are copies. And the in the competition, uh, a lot of people participated, including, including Jacopo della Quercia, that some of you might remember, for uh, the beautiful funeral monument of Ilaria del Carretto in Lucca, uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti, and Filippo Brunelleschi. All extremely important names. Um, Lorenzo Ghiberti uh, came out to be the winner according to his own uh, account. It was an unanimous decision. According to other accounts, it was not unanimous and actually he did everything he could, everything in the book and more to... Um, now I'm losing it. There you go. Better. Yes. So he did everything he could to win the competition. And uh, Brunelleschi, the, the architect that designed the, uh, the dome of the cathedral, lost and apparently he left Florence in a haste to show all his disdain for the jury that didn't award him the commission to build the door of the cathedral. So on the, um, on the first door, the door by Pisano, there were scenes of the life of St. John the Baptist and here you have scenes of the life of Jesus. And on the bottom uh, eight squares, there are the four evangelists that you recognize from the symbols they are associated with and underneath the fathers of the church. So eight with the four evangelists and the father of the church and then scenes from the life of Jesus that you can recognize. There is a beautiful Last Supper right there. I want to show you right there. Isn't it stunning? And the Kalimala de Arte uh, of the, the Guild of the Merchants uh, also gave an amount of bronze, a set amount of bronze to the, um, to the artists that were participating. They didn't want them to splurge too much. So Ghiberti won, and after he completed this door, he also won. We are going to go back to the facade of the cathedral in a few minutes. Hold on. We are completing our tour of the baptistry. So after... Ghiberti won the competition for uh, the North Door. He also was given, Kalimala was so impressed and they liked so much what they saw that they actually asked him to prepare uh, a second set of bronze uh, panels for what would be called La Porta del Paradiso, that was nicknamed by Michelangelo, La Porta del Paradiso, Heaven's Gate. This is actually the most important of the doors because it faces the cathedral. And it's the door through which uh, the people that have just been baptized uh, would be in, uh, introduced uh, into the cathedral. As you see, it's a very short walk. You would walk out of here and you would enter the door there. So it's the door through which uh, the newly baptized uh, exited the, the baptistry to get into the cathedral. As you can see, the, the difference, the main difference with the 
with the other door by Ghiberti is that here there are, the panels are much bigger. Uh, they don't have the very peculiar shape, the quadrilovata shape. They're just uh, more rectangular, but they're much more elaborate in the background. And you see that there are either architectures like this, that gives a great sense of depth and perspective, or natural scenes like in the above panel, where you see that there are forests and tents, and there is the back, the, the, the skyline of the city in the in the in the background. So these are scenes from the ancient testament um, that you can recognize. That's in the marriage of King Solomon and Queen Saba. Uh, there are battle scenes that are very elaborate. Again, this is gilded bronze, and there are the heads of the prophets in these beautiful uh, little roundels. There you go. Stunning. Again, these are copies. The original in gilded bronze are in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. And we now continue our tour. Um, and we'll start with the... We leave the cathedral last, even if it's the building that gives the name to the entire square. And what we will concentrate on right now Oh, I forgot to mention, of course, that uh, the baptistry is still used for baptisms. Uh, among many other Florentines that was baptized in here, there was Dante Alighieri that, despite his uh, stormy relationship with Florence, always uh, remembers his baptistry with uh, great fondness. And he was hoping one day to receive the coronation as poet in his baptistry, in what he calls Il Mio Bel San Giovanni. And he never did. So we are at the bottom of the Campanile. Impressive. It's about 100 meters. You can climb up the Campanile. It's about uh, 400 steps if you feel like doing so. Uh, the first architect of the Campanile was Giotto, that I'm sure all of you have known, have heard of. And Giotto, as you know, he's much more famous as a painter than as um, a sculptor or an architect, but he was given this commission uh, writing on his fame as a painter. And as you can see, he introduces another chromatic element compared to the side of the cathedral. And the baptistry that are white and dark green. He adds these beautiful pink, reddish marble from the land surrounding Siena. And uh, it's a very elaborate uh, project. It's a very elaborate uh, plan that he had. And in these um, formals that you see, there is the invention of all disciplines, the invention of music, the invention of uh, architecture, the invention of astronomy. They're pretty easy to recognize, actually. Uh, once again, these are copies. The originals are in the um, Cathedral Museum. See the invention of astronomy, the invention of architecture, the invention of medicine, the invention of horse riding. You gotta love the invention of medicine. There you go. And horse riding and justice, seeking Solomon there, and Icarus, invention of flying. Giotto didn't live long enough, of course, to see the completion of the bell tower. Actually, uh, the legend had it that he uh, died when he realized that he had not planned well for, there you go, you see the beauty of this bell tower, as you know there is a word in Italian, campanilismo, that means for an Italian his bell tower is the most beautiful bell tower in the world, but if you're from Florence it's really hard not to think so. And um, it's the beautiful gothic windows that open up, um, 
they serve a decorative purpose, but they also serve to take away uh, construction material and therefore to um, lower the, the weight towards the top of the campanile to make it more stable on its base. Um, so this is Giotto. And again, Giotto was uh, in charge of the entire uh, building of the cathedral and the bell tower. The story has it that he did not really take a great interest in the cathedral per se, and he was very interested in the possibility of starting the campanile and basically putting his signature on it. So we are now uh, walking by the side of the, of the cathedral. And you see this beautiful motif of the uh, white, green, and red marble that create this sort of harmony, this sort of music along the sides of the cathedral. Uh, this is one of the largest churches in the world, apparently number three. I'm not big on list of churches by uh, greatness, uh, but that's what it is. Now, a little curiosity. You see that right there, there are ambulances. There, is a, there are four, three, four ambulances. And you might be able to read that on top of them, they say Misericordia. Misericordia means mercy. And the tradition has it that in Florence, um, ambulances are still uh, operated by the ancient brotherhoods and sisterhoods of the Middle Ages that took care of the, of the poor, of the sick, of the pilgrims, and uh, they still serve the same purpose. They are uh, staffed by volunteers along with professional doctors and nurses. And when you're in Florence and you don't feel well, and people come to you and say, shall we call mercy? Chiamiamo la misericordia, and they don't simply mean we're going to invoke mercy for you, but we're going to call an ambulance. And that's still called misericordia. So that's a little sidebar in our, in our tour. So we continue our walk. Um, the first architect of the, of the cathedral was Arnolfo di Cambio. Arnolfo di Cambio, it's a name that should be familiar uh, to you if you have not been on the walk into Tour of Piazza della Signoria. You can uh, look it up. It's on the YouTube page or on the Facebook page of Casa Italiana Zarilli Marimò. And Arnolfo di Cambio was the architect responsible for the Palazzo della Signoria. And at the same time, he received this commission. So he must have been a pretty hot archie star at the time. Um, and again, of course, he couldn't complete the work by himself. We don't even know whether there was, there was an original uh, plan, a blueprint for the entire cathedral. Also because the, the, um, what we know for sure is that the plan expanded with time and while they were building it, they decided to make it uh, bigger. What we know for sure is that they always wanted to have a dome on this cathedral. And at the same time, they had no idea how to build a dome. Um, they saw the dome of the Pantheon in Rome, but there was no knowledge of the uh, technical details of how the Pantheon was built. And so there were many structural problems on, uh, in order to avoid such a large dome to collapse uh, onto its own weight. Um, the problem of what kind of scaffolding you need to in order to be able to support the workers that uh, are inside these, this place. So many, many problems. And uh, in uh, 1400, a man called Filippo Brunelleschi, that you have already heard many times, uh, comes up with an idea. And he says he has a perfect idea for it. And when he's summoned by the Signoria to explain his idea, they want him to tell them exactly how he thinks to um, approach this issue and uh, he refuses he refuses to reveal the secret and uh, it's actually more than one secret i'm not going to get into the details technical details of the building of the dome because there are beautiful uh, documentaries that you can find uh, online uh, where they go into great details they have reconstructions animations uh, um, suffice to say that there is a double shell and that um, Brunelleschi plan didn't need uh, to have a uh, scaffold. Basically, it was self-supporting as they were uh, going up with the building. And that the internal uh, shell of the, of the dome is entirely frescoed uh, by Vasari. Um, and this is the original uh, painter. It's the biggest uh, dome uh, 
in the entire world still now, and the biggest uh, fresco surface, the one inside the dome. And if you want, you can also climb up the dome. Now, we're gonna turn around, because I think we need to show you this guy. He deserves it. There you go. See Filippo Brunelleschi there, portrayed in this statue, permanently watching the result of his work, his dome. As legend has it, when Michelangelo was summoned to Rome by the Pope uh, to build uh, St. Peter's Basilica's dome, he came here uh, to take his leave from Brunelleschi's dome and looking at it very much like Brunelleschi in the statue, apparently took his leave and bid farewell to the dome of his beloved Florence by saying, I'm going to go to Rome to build a sister to you. She might be bigger. She'll never be as beautiful as you are. And right he was i think this is unbeaten in terms of, of beauty shapes and everything else um the dome of the cathedral is uh, a constant presence as you walk around florence um, because the plan was that and it has been maintained uh, the plan was that no building civic or otherwise residential commercial religious uh, political could go above the lower level of the dome and that's why from everywhere you are in Florence the skyline the skyline is dominated by uh, the beautiful dome the cathedral is dedicated to uh, Santa Maria del Fiore our lady of the flower that's the entire thing it's about fiore Florence, Fiorenza, Città del Fiore, and also the Virgin Mary, of course, is invoked under the title Our Lady of the Flower. And you see there are, the dome is surrounded by smaller domes that create a sort of an illusion of a flower with a stem. So we're literally walking around it. We are now behind the apse so it's behind the high altar of Santa Maria del Fiore. It's a, it's a church and a square that saw a lot of things throughout the centuries. Just to mention a few, in 1438, uh, the great council of the church that tried to reunify the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church, it actually succeeded for a very short time because the fathers of the Eastern even lantern dome. So I was telling you that in 1438, the Council of the Church gathers here in Florence and and the two churches are unified. It's a great occasion, but it really doesn't last long. And by the time the Orthodox bishops are back in Constantinople, uh, the union that they reached very briefly here in Florence is already gone. Uh, here you see a part of the cathedral that has not been cleaned up and restored yet. Uh, it's still beautiful and it still has its charm, but you see the difference between this side um, that is still uh, stained by decades uh, of pollution, uh, smog, acid, acid rains, and so on and so forth. And you see the difference that uh, with the part that has been restored already. Um, and now you hear the bells. I promise I didn't plan for it. it just happened. But these are not the bells of the cathedral. So you see the difference between the restored part, the cleaned up part, and the part that still needs to be cleaned. Of course, we are talking about hundreds of square feet of marble to be cleaned, and it's not a cleaning that can be done uh, with heavy machines. It has to be done very delicately uh, by specialized restorers. So, and here you see the difference very clearly.
231, that's the 1438 Council of the Church, just a couple of uh, big things that happened inside this cathedral. And then, of course, the 1478, the Pazzi conspiracy, when the members of the Pazzi family and their allies um, tried to kill uh, Lorenzo de' Medici and his brother Giuliano. They succeeded in killing uh, Giuliano here inside the church during high mass, um, stopped by uh, conspirators. And uh, Lorenzo managed to escape uh, the murder and to run to the sacristy and find shelter there and then seek refuge inside his palace that is uh, really next door. So I just wanted to point out these two historical facts uh, that happened inside the cathedral. The Council of Florence, 1438, and the Pazzi Conspiracy, 1478. Of course, many more things. It's also a place where uh, there are lots of rituals, as you can imagine, and traditions that take place here, including uh, on Easter Day, there is the uh, Scopio del Carro, uh, there is a very complicated machine uh, with the reproduction of a dove uh, that actually has some sort of incendiary device inside and the Archbishop uh, lights uh, up the dove and it's sent on a rope from the baptistry to the high altar in the cathedral where it explodes to the cheers of the Florentines. That's one of the uh, strange Florentine traditions that still survive today. And then, of course, all the celebrations of uh, San Giovanni, uh, the patron saint of Florence, on June 24th, uh, that see the entire city involved. Now, we are almost at the end of our walking tour. And of course, I told you that I would keep the, the facade of the cathedral last. Um, also because it's the last thing that was built um, for the longest time, for centuries, um, the cathedral was unfinished and there was no real facade uh, on it. It was rough hewn stone. So it's only in the 19th century, yes, you heard well, the 19th century, that the city decides to complete the facade because Florence had become, briefly, only for five years, um, the capital of Italy, and they found sort of shameful that the cathedral of the capital of Italy uh, was still undone. So if you think that basically the, the main um, workshop to build the cathedral was started in the 12th century, it took them about 600 years to complete it. And it was uh, finished only in 1886. Uh, there is a lot written, of course, about the facade. It's in the eclectic neo-Gothic style. As you see, it employs all the materials that are employed uh, in the baptistry and the bell tower and more. So, for example, here you have mosaics uh, on the archways of the door uh, with the golden background. Uh, there are statues. Um, there are decorations that are very, very uh, minute and refined. There is a beautiful rose window on top. Um, there, of course, are many critics of the facade that argue that it's really uh, a bit too much compared to the uh, simplicity of both the baptistry, the side of the cathedral, and the bell tower. But still, once you know the story behind it, and uh, once you think that this was the last time in which Florence in the 19th century had a claim to be the capital of Italy, I think they wanted to overdo it, maybe a little bit too much. But the final result is not bad. It's very impressive. It's very imposing. It's reminiscent also of uh, other Tuscan cathedrals, Gothic cathedrals, like the Cathedral of Siena or the Cathedral of Pisa. So all in all, I think we can be very satisfied. So there are many more things that I would like to tell you about this place, and I hope you um, were satisfied with our walking tour. Again, um, for, for me, the difficulty was not to knock you down with too many stories, but to uh, just tell you the essential minimum to help you appreciate once more 
this uh, unique place uh, in the world. And uh, the reason behind these tours, as you know, is that I know that many of you cannot travel to Italy and many of you are telling me uh, their um, regret of not being able to be here. Many of you can come during the summer and you could not be here. Things are slowly going back to normal in Florence and in the rest of Italy. And hopefully soon you will be able, able to come back to Italy and to enjoy. And if I reach my goal, it is to instill inside your heart the desire to come back to Florence and enjoy it on your own feet, with your own eyes, as soon as you can. Um, I'm getting ready for more, walk with the director. I'm going to be in Florence for a little bit more. So let me know if there is any other place in Florence that you would like me to walk through with you and for you. And I will try to, uh, to go there. And I'm also considering other cities in Tuscany, maybe Lucca, maybe Pisa. Um, so your suggestions are welcome. And uh, probably in a couple of weeks, we're going to do another tour. Uh, keep your eyes open on IN. Keep your eyes open on our Facebook page, on our social media, um, on our website. And if you are not uh, receiving our newsletter, please sign up and you can do so from our website, www.casaitalianaNYU.org. It was great walking with you and for you in Piazza del Duomo in Florence, and I hope to see you again soon for our next one. Bye. Ciao.